Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, PPE and Combustible Dust, the often overlooked piece of protection, sponsored by Bulwark. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you all for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Please feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Derek Sang, who has worked in the flame-resistant clothing industry for more than 20 years. He has developed more than 250 educational and informational seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire, and 40 hours of training courses for Bulwark University covering every aspect of flame-resistant clothing. A recognized subject matter expert, Derek is also a qualified safety sales professional, certified environmental health safety professional, and certified safety, health, and environmental technician. Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Alan, and thank you for that kind introduction. And welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, combustible dust and personal protective equipment, that, that often overlooked piece. And uh, let's get right into it because we uh, obviously are just going to be able to touch the surface uh, of this uh, topic in the 45 to 50 minutes that we're going to spend here today. Uh, the agenda obviously just cover a little bit on what combustible dust is for those who may be on that uh, are not familiar with it. And then we'll talk a little bit through some of the regulations and standards that affect that. And then really kind of the, the nexus of today's subject is uh, creating a flame-resistant clothing uh, program for those who may be affected uh, with this hazard. So what is combustible dust? Well, combustible dust, by definition, if you look at NFPA 654 2013, is, is defined as a finely divided combustible particulate solid that presents a flash fire hazard or explosion hazard when suspended in air or the process specific oxidizing medium over a range of concentrations. Really, that, that's a long-winded way of saying if this stuff is small enough and gets in the air, diffuse enough, mean finely distributed enough, and it hits an ignition source, you can create a fireball. And by creating that fireball inside a confined space, and by this definition is, is loosely defined confined space as something like inside a building, you potentially could have an explosive hazard. So when we look at our fire triangle, everybody kind of understands that if you have fire or excuse me, if you have ignition and if you have oxygen and you have fuel in the right concentrations in that triangle, you have potential for fire. For flash fires, you add diffusion of that fuel. Now you've got a flash fire hazard. And then if you confine it, now you've got where we have the combustible dust pentagon. And that's where combustible dust gets really scary. So before we get too far along today, uh, I know one of the things we want to do is just take a quick survey. So I'm going to give you a few seconds here. So why wear FR instead of street clothes where combustible dust hazards may be present? So your options are, well, everyday fabrics can ignite, burn, and possibly melt. Everyday fabrics increase the extent of workers' injuries. 
Because a combustible duct explosion can turn into a chain reaction explosion that can involve the entire facility or all of the above. So I'll give you a few seconds here to make your choice. And look at that, whether it was uh, everybody or the two or three people that took time to do that, everybody got the right answer. So obviously we, we understand clearly that wearing clothing that could possibly ignite, continue to burn is going to add to the injury and obviously not be a good thing. So are there ignition sources in, in the job site where combustible dusts may be uh, present? Well, of course there are. Think about facilities. Think about your facilities in particular. Think about some of the things that your people may be doing. One of the easiest uh, analogies to paint a picture of it is think about if you've ever had welding going on in your facility. Your welder comes up. He creates his safe work area. He may include uh, his FR drapes. He may be uh, quartering off his area. He may even be doing some preliminary housekeeping there at ground level. But how many welders, in fact, even can access some of your I-beam girders that may be suspended well above his head? All of a sudden, our forklift, our high bay, 30, 40 yards away in the facility, backs into one of the support beams. While you hear the clunk, you hear a kind of or feel kind of a shudder and that, that whole kind of uh, structure begins to shake. Well, well above your welder, who's now five, 10 minutes into his job, you have dust that's been on the flat surfaces of that I-beam, that girder, now starts to sprinkle down and diffusely falls down into that once clean welding area, well, what could potentially happen? Well, if that dust is fine enough and that dust is indeed combustible, you could create a flash fire in an area to where, for example, your welder was once thought uh, to be safe, clear, and clean, and well housekeeped, where uh, unfortunately it wasn't. So that's some of the things that we see there when we talk about potential ignition sources in your facilities. Common combustible dust, uh, all the practical things that we think about. Just, just take wood dust and food dust, for example. You've almost got 50% of all potential combustible dust in those two categories. Add in metals like aluminum, copper, iron, and believe it or not, those metals where those dusts are fine enough are indeed combustible. So we see a lot of materials that we may not normally think of as being combustible when they are in this diffuse format are in fact very highly combustible. So what is too much dust? Uh, easiest example for uh, us to understand is if you can tell from whence you came, meaning is you walk through your facility and you look back and you see footprints in your facility from the dust that's being generated in your process, you potentially have too much dust and a combustible dust hazard. The other way to look at it is if you take a number 40 standard industrial sieve and you take the byproducts of what you do, put it in that sieve and gently shake it and material falls through that sieve, that is small enough that you're going to have to go get that dust tested to deem if, it is in, if it's potentially combustible and then a dust hazard. So why are we talking about this? Well, primarily we're talking about it for a couple of reasons. We have long known in our industrial complex that dust accidents and dust explosions happen. Uh, from 1980 to 2005, in a 25-year period, the Chemical Safety Board determined that about 281 combustible dust accidents happened, and about 119 deaths and over 700 injuries occurred from these hazards in the United States alone. Many of you remember back probably uh, definitely the one with the, the most injuries and probably one of the, the most documented 
is if you go back to the Imperial uh, Sugar incident in 2006, we had uh, 13, 14 fatalities, and depending on which report, anywhere from 25 to 50 injuries occurred from that single event. And if you can tell looking at this imagery, the reason that these are so significant is because of the chain reaction component to combustible dust incident is these can go facility-wide relatively quickly. As opposed to where you may isolate a fire in a certain area or even an explosion of some kind in a certain area, because dust can be facility-wide and you have one explosion which shakes uh, loose more dust, another explosion which shakes loose more dust, the actual explosions and the shaking loose of dust continues to feed these events through these facilities, which can obviously be devastating. So where are we at kind of with, with OSHA and standards and some of the regulatory piece of it? Unfortunately, right now, we don't have any regulations in and around combustible dust directly. Uh, the Chemical Safety Board, CSB, has been lobbying OSHA for years now to have regulations in and around uh, combustible dust. A few years ago, uh, there was a national emphasis program for uh, combustible dust generated uh, some activity, generated some attention to it. Unfortunately, the NEEP has since uh, went away, and we still don't have any uh, combustible dust regulations from an OSHA standpoint. That being said, obviously, we still have the general duty clause, and we still have numerous uh, combustible dust uh, standards in which to help us. So OSHA is the shall. You shall protect your people. You shall protect your people. Uh, against hazards, uh, standards like NFPA 70, excuse me, like NFPA is the how-to, uh, along with our ANSI standards, our ASTM standards, etc. So, in NFPA, we have a number of specific standards for uh, dust and combustible dust in food processing, and combustible dust in metals, sulfur. Uh, wood processing, uh, coal mines, etc. So we do have standards specific to actual uh, production and, and processes. NFPA 654 came along, and that was kind of widely seen as uh, hopefully filling in some of the gaps. And it really did help from a, from a housekeeping standpoint and providing some direction as far as, as, as mitigating uh, the hazards as far as housekeeping goes. Uh, 654, again, as I said, was kind of focused on uh, preventing the ignition of dust, limiting the consequences of, of explosions, talked about removing uh, dust from facilities, uh, duct systems, vacuuming systems, and again, good general uh, operators, maintenance, uh, maintenance procedures as far as housekeeping goes from that standpoint. Didn't talk a lot about, uh, in the hierarchy of safety, did not talk a lot about PPE. They did have uh, some temporary interim uh, amendments later on that referenced uh, NFPA 2112 and NFPA 2113, and we'll talk about that here a little bit uh, down the line. We were still in need of more gap filling. Uh, 654 did some of that. The uh, NFPA committees did recognize there was additional work needed, and that's where NFPA 652 came into place. The new standard really established the relationship and the hierarchy between it and any of the other industry uh, commodity-specific standards that we referred to earlier. This was really seen as an umbrella uh, standard, so to speak, where it was going to fill in uh, where the other standards uh, were short. What it looked to do from a federal regulation standpoint is give OSHA from a, an enforcement view really something to attach to that general duty clause for the first time. 
and this is going to be this is sound going to sound kind of quirky, but in the administration piece of 652, this is where it talks about that uh, the protocol as far as any discrepancies. And what do I mean by that? That means where if the standard, the specific standard to whatever industry you're in, and you look to apply that, and it differs from the general, which is 652 here, then you focus on your standard. So if your industry standard is better than 652, focus on your standard. If your standard doesn't address something that 652 does, then obviously default to 652. So really 652 was designed to remove any kind of conflicts between an industry specific standard and the general standard being 652. The next piece, and this is kind of the important piece where we start diving into the dust hazard assessment part of it, is if you are generating dust, you now are responsible to determine whether that dust, as it's generated in your facility, is indeed a hazard. You must determine whether or not that that dust potentially can be combustible. It walks you through certain definitions, it's got, and I'm not going to take a lot of time here. This is something, obviously, from a dust hazard analysis standpoint, what a flash fire is, and then obviously a risk assessment. The whole definition piece is pretty easily followed and, and very easily understood. The next piece is, in the next chapter, is when we start talking responsibility as far as hazard identification. As with all hazards, the responsibility is going to follow on that owner-operator to determine whether or not that dust is combustible. If a dust is deemed combustible or explosible, a dust hazard analysis or DHA must be conducted to determine whether existing workplace conditions could cause the dust to ignite, burn, and explode. So backing up, here's where it's a little bit different than what 654 was saying and what some of the other ones were saying. If the dust is deemed combustible or explosive, that that's one piece of the puzzle. The next piece of the puzzle is you must conduct your hazard assessment in your workplace to deem whether the conditions could cause it to ignite and burn and explode. So they're, they're kind of two halves to the same coin, so to speak, down that line. This is the new part, and this is the part where we're going to kind of focus on for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Chapter 8 is where we walk into personal protective equipment. Once that workplace hazard is done and it's deemed that that workplace could have potential for a dust explosion or a flash fire from that dust going into a dust explosion, flame-resistant clothing is going to be required in those areas where that hazard exists. Now, this is a little different than some of the, the interpretations prior to 652. Six, prior to 652, it was almost like, hey, if you have combustible dust, if you're generating dust that could be combustible, this is going to be a facility-wide adoption of FR. What 652 is saying is that in these areas where this hazard could be present, that is the areas in which FR clothing is going to be required. Now. That may be facility-wide, be facility that may not be, but that's going to be up to the individual facilities to determine where that hazard exists and can that hazard be confined to that area, and thus protecting those people who are only in and doing that particular function where that hazard uh, exists. The most significant takeaways, obviously, of 652 are it places the responsibility for dust hazard analysis on the owner-operator. There is a timeline here. September 7, 2018 it is determined for you as the owner-operator of a facility to do that DHA. Then you have to go into training and awareness once that's done and then determine whether FR clothing requirements 
are, are necessary for folks in and around where that hazard may be present. And then obviously even taking it a step further is now implementing a written policy for the care, cleaning, and maintenance of FR garments. And that's where it takes it a little bit deeper into NFPA 2113. So we're actually going to step out of NFPA 652, and NFPA 652 says once you determine that you have this hazard, once you determine that it's flash fire, then you're going to have to go to NFPA uh, 2113 for additional uh, direction and additional information. So, conclusion, employees who could be exposed to a combustible dust explosion should be in FR clothing. Four, how to select that FR clothing, how to use it, care for and maintain it, you're going to refer to NFPA 2113. So, within NFPA 652, it actually references NFPA 2113 as to how to comply to, from an FR clothing standpoint, with NFPA 652. So what does that all mean? So you have within NFPA 2113, it's going to tell you when you're looking at FR garments that those FR garments meet NFPA 2112. So we're throwing around a lot of numbers here between the different standards. All you have to know is this. NFPA 2113 is how to select, use, care, and maintain FR clothing for industrial personnel who could be exposed to a short-term thermal, dur dur uh, thermal exposure, which is a flash fire. NFPA 2112 is for the industry folks like Bulwark, like others, on how to build the garments to meet 2113. So not to further complicate things, but 2112 is how to design and certify garments to meet the 2113 uh, sta uh, standard. So what it is is just a, a way of certifying fabrics, findings, and facilities in order to build protective apparel for this hazard. What it does for folks who are selecting garments, it gives them peace of mind that these garments have been uh, designed in and around the thermal exposure they're going to be exposed to. So it provides some common sense protocol for issues like conducting a hazard assessment, that's in 2113, selecting FR garments, properly using FR garments, and ultimately how to care and maintain them because once you select them and once you uh, are using them, you have to know how to care and maintain these. So again, why not wear everyday street clothing? You guys ace that at the uh, a few slides in. Everyday clothing can ignite and continue to burn and obviously not only cause catastrophic uh, injuries, but it's going to further extend the thermal event well beyond uh, the actual uh, initial fuel did because you're now involving the clothing that you're wearing. In fact, when we go and do these post-incident events and when folks like CSB have done their post-incident events, they find that the vast majority of injuries in these combustible dust incidents are burns. And many of the burns are being caused because the clothing worn at work that day did not have any flame-resistant properties and thus added to the injuries. In fact, uh, fortunately it wasn't in this country, but the, the, one of the largest combustible uh, dust explosions we've seen was in China a few years ago at the uh, aluminum wheel factory in uh, China where they had a massive combustible dust explosion. And many of the pictures where you saw them triaging uh, the employees in the parking lot after the event, many of those pictures you saw where people had, they were wearing no clothes because the clothes had in fact been burned off of them and many of those injuries 
that had incurred uh, to those employees were indeed uh, burn injuries because of their clothing catching fire. So how do you create an FR clothing program? Well, first and foremost, uh, what is FR clothing? Well, the plain and the simples of it is, is FR clothing is simply designed to self-extinguish once that short-term thermal event is over. Uh, it's made from fabrics that in many cases today are natural fibers for comfort, synthetic fibers for, for durability. Remember, all FR clothing is designed to limit, not eliminate burn injury. But that being said, survival is directly correlated to the extent of burn injury you have, how much second and third degree uh, body burn was incurred, and anything that we can do to drive that number down is going to directly correlate to survivability or how well you come out of that thermal event. So what you can see here in these three uh, pictures is the first picture is a FR coverall. The middle picture is it going through ASTM 1930 test protocol, which is a three-second controlled burn at 360 degrees. And then the third picture you see is even though the dye was burned off because you see a navy coverall that we started with, you see a tan coverall that we finished with, that's the dye being uh, burned off during that thermal event. The integrity of the coverall is there. It's no longer uh, burning. It's put itself out. That's, uh, in essence, what FR clothing is designed to do. Thus, it minimizes injury. One of the things that we do when we, when we train folks on uh, what FR clothing is and, and when to wear it, one of the biggest things that we have to drive home is that this is uh, secondary protective apparel not primary protective apparel. And what do we mean by that? The definition of primary, for example, the easiest uh, one to understand is, for example, firefighters. If you have a structural uh, flame, uh, that firefighter is going to put on his bunker gear, his specialized hard hat, his breathing apparatus, specialized gloves, boots, and he's going to voluntarily walk into a thermal event. Now, how is he able to do that? Well, two reasons. One, he's a firefighter. That's what he's trained to do. And secondly, he trusts his PPE to do what it's designed to do, and that's a long-term exposure to thermal hazards. Secondary protective clothing is designed for short-term exposure to thermal hazards. Now, the difference between primary and secondary, when you look at those two examples, is does that firefighter wear all that PPE when he's back at the station house? Well, the answer is no. Not unless it's rookie hazing night, he doesn't. He's going to take all that stuff off because it's task-based. He is knowingly going into a thermal event. He's going to don his PPE and go into the thermal event. In our world, when do we have to be wearing our PPE? The short answer is all the time, because whether these are arc flashes uh, for electrical, flash fires for combustible dust or uh, refining oil and gas, anything like those where those hazards are available, we need to be wearing our stuff all the time because these are accidental events. A combustible dust explosion, a combustible dust flash fire is something that is accidental. It's not something that is knowingly going to happen in our facility. So in order to protect ourselves, we have to be wearing it all the time. So as you think about PPE in the hierarchy of uh, protection, in the hierarchy of safety, obviously we want to eliminate or replace the combustible dust hazard. We want to engineer that combust combustible dust hazard out. That's when we start looking at uh, ducting systems, vacuuming systems, administration and policies. That's where we want to have good housekeeping and everything else uh, that goes along with uh, potentially having combustible dust on site. 
Then our last line of defense, and this is the piece to where kind of a lot of the standards kind of uh, stop short of, a lot of the safety protocols kind of stop short of. We understand the hierarchies of control, but when it came to combustible dust, everything kind of stopped at housekeeping, and really PPE was often overlooked. And when you look at the dynamics of combustible dust, these are flash fires. In fact, when you read the definition in NFPA 2112 and NFPA 2113, which were written for short-term thermal exposures, the number one hazard that they reference is dust. Dusts have long well been known to be flash fire hazards. Now, the, the nuance that we talked about is the chain reaction component of it when it happens in, in a facility where it's potential to go from uh, point of origin to moving through a facility because the dust keeps feeding the explosions. That's one dynamic, but the hazard in and of itself is a flash fire. So when we look at creating a FR clothing program for flash fire protection, we talk about engineered flame-resistant fabrics. Uh, today, most fabrics are going to be natural and synthetic blends. Um, we tell people when you're evaluating uh, garments, look for proven products made with proven uh, fabrics. Uh, look for uh, companies that have had a long time in providing this type of PPE if this is indeed uh, new to you. I apologize, we've got a little bit of a time lag here on our slides. The next piece that you have to is once you've kind of selected what direction you want to go with your FR clothing program, make sure you train your folks. 1910-132, there you go, right in there with your PPE. Uh, whether you're talking respirators, gas monitors, anything else along those lines, now clothing becomes PPE. You need to train your folks on it. Train your folks on making sure how they properly uh, wear it. Make sure they understand on how to properly don and doff this. Make sure they understand on how to properly clean it. If you're using a third-party cleaning service, that they understand that this is PPE and how it needs to uh, be cared for and maintained. If it's something where you're gonna allow your employees uh, to take garments uh, home to launder, that you, you give them the proper uh, guidelines on how to take care of that at home. Uh, make sure that you've kind of audited. If you're using an industrial laundry now for non-FR, when it goes to FR, make sure that they can clearly explain, explain to you the process that they're going to implement to uh, care for your FR clothing because it does move from shirts, pants, and coveralls to PPE and uh, being a life-saving piece of equipment versus just a, uh, a non-FR shirt and a non-FR pant for uh, soil protection, for example. So to wrap this up and leave some time here uh, for some questions, uh, in the hierarchy of safety measures and precautions in any safe, uh, safety program, personal protective equipment is the last line of defense. But like any other last line of defense, you have to have it on in order for it to work. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, task-based PPE for uh, these type of thermal exposures tend not to work. Uh, for example, if you deem that uh, my people are only going to be exposed during cleanup, uh, then they're only going to go put their coverall whenever we're doing any kind of housekeeping process. That tends to be very, very difficult to manage. It's much better to identify those that could be potentially exposed to the hazard and make sure that they're wearing that FR clothing from the time they're on the facility to the time that they leave the facility. Uh, FR clothing is designed, again, to self-extinguish once the ignition source is removed, but it's not going to guarantee that the wearer will be unharmed. These are designed to mitigate uh, injury, not eliminate injury. 
when you're looking at evaluating FR clothing, uh, you're going to want to make sure that those garments meet NFTA 2112. That is the manufacturing standard required to uh, meet for the protection against folks who could potentially be exposed to a flash fire. Uh, last and kind of least, as you're evaluating this, it's really important to, to partner with market-proven uh, supply chain partners. Again, uh, there's lots of places where you can go and get uh, FR shirts, pants, or coveralls. There's lots of folks manufacturing FR shirts, pants, and coveralls. The price range you may are, are going to find is going to vary uh, in some cases uh, dramatically uh, from one source to the other. This is one kind of caveat to think about. It doesn't matter what they cost today because unlike regular shirts, pants, and coveralls, the important piece is after an event. If something happens and the PPE that you purchased did not work as thought or did not work as advertised, that is going to negate any potential savings along the way. And unfortunately, it's going to be very, very difficult to determine whether that FR shirt pant or coverall is going to work as advertised until it's in an event. It's really important to look at the supply chain as far as what experience do they have in this market, what kind of uh, fabrics they're utilizing to manufacture uh, these shirts, pants, and coveralls, and what peace of mind can they give you uh, that if things go wrong that they're going to be able to stand by their product and thus stand by you in case anything unfortunately uh, happens. So with that being said, I think uh, Alan alluded to it that we're gonna take some, some questions here. If we don't get to everybody's questions during the time remaining, uh, I will make a point of getting uh, those questions and getting those answers to everybody uh, via email. So again, I want to thank you for your time, and hopefully uh, this was uh, informative and beneficial. Great job, Derek. Uh, thank you for your excellent insights and expertise. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Now let's get to some questions. Could you uh, please describe the uh, proper versus improper laundering of uh, FR clothing? Yeah, good question. And uh, the reason that we say that this uh, that FR clothing can be laundered at home or uh, industrial laundered is because it is relatively easy. Uh, the majority of uh, commercially viable uh, garments today uh, have a good uh, history in the marketplace, and really you just have to avoid a, a few things. Uh, first and foremost, don't use bleach. Second, don't use peroxide. Where do you find peroxide today? You're going to find peroxide in products like OxyClean. That's kind of the sneaky one because we're always looking for that little advantage, uh, especially if, if, if uh, clothing seems to be stained or otherwise, stay away from, from OxyClean. Uh, in the next process, stay away from fabric softeners, whether that's in, in the uh, liquid format or whether that's in a dryer sheet format, uh, your fabric softeners are going to be typically petroleum-based. Uh, you're going to potentially, uh, if you use that over time, you could mask the FR properties uh, on your shirt, pant, or coverall, and they wouldn't be able to react as, uh, as they need to uh, in that thermal event. So th those are the, the big ones. Stay away from uh, chlorine. Stay away from peroxides. Stay away from fabric softeners. Use just general liquid or powdered uh, washing uh, material and, and utilize it that way. And then just uh, throw it in the dryer and good to go. 
Our next question, do eye protection, hard hats, respirators, hearing protection, gloves, or shoes have fire ratings? Uh, that's There's a lot of uh, categories of PPE that you just asked in that question out. For example, if you're dealing with our electrical folks, you're dealing with uh, arc-rated face shields, you have uh, obviously your, your various uh, categories of hard hats uh, from, from general all the way through uh, electrical. You have dielectric uh, boots for electrical hazards. So for all the things that, that you, you mentioned, uh, there's going to be different uh, categories and classifications for each. I would just in general make, say make sure that you are matching up each and all of those with uh, whatever uh, hazards you've identified uh, in your workplace and match accordingly. How many times can FR clothing be washed without losing its uh, FR capability? Great question. And uh, I'm going to temper it this way. Uh, I have to answer this question when it comes to uh, or as it pertains to bulwark protective apparel. And that's all the shirts, pants, and coveralls, jackets, et cetera, that Bulwark manufacturers is guaranteed to be flame resistant for the life of that garment. And that, that's across all our fabric offerings. And the reason we say it that way is because you as a wearer, as an individual, are going to put certain stresses on a shirt, pant, or coverall that someone else in the same job doing the same thing may or may not do. So you may find that your shirt pant just in general lasts 18 months. Your coworker side beside you might find out that his shirt pant coverall lasts 36 months. The life of the garment is its wear life as it pertains to being threadbare, worn out, just normal everyday decision making as far as when to remove a garment from service. None of the FR properties, regardless of the technologies that Bulwark utilizes, are affected through normal through normal laundering. You can't wash it out. Are greens, orange, yellows FR clothing usually used for burning slash welding and um, molten metal industry? So uh, by greens, visual greens, uh, typically in welding, uh, you may find that there's still a technology or people utilizing what's called Proban FR7A. Uh, that's very, very rudimentary, basic uh, way to make uh, cotton flame resistant. It was used, it's, it has been used and is still around, but was primarily used in the steel industry back in the 70s, but the technology still exists to where you can go into a welding supply house and pick up a very, very inexpensive uh, shirt jack coverall made with Proban FR7A. That technology still exists. It's very, very rudimentary. It's utilized for... 25 to 50 launderings, and then the FR properties are gone. Welders typically don't launder their material all that often, so they tend to not be concerned about their welding greens in that sense. So that technology does exist. Now, just because it's green, yellow, or orange does not necessarily mandate what the FR technology is. So I would first and foremost take a look at what that label says and make sure that you are matching the fabric performance to the hazard. Uh, for molten metals, uh, typically when you start looking at white metals like aluminum, uh, those are very specific fabrics that work in that hazard. Uh, when you start looking at uh, oil and gas flash fires, there are fabrics that work in that area. And then when you look at arc flash for utilities and uh, NFPA 70E, there are fabrics that work really well in there. So just by color designation alone, does that not necessarily mandate where that uh, garment can be or should be used? If you need to repair a garment, can you put a patch on it, or what type of thread do you need to use? 
One of the requirements for repairs are like material and Nomex or Aramid thread. So what that says is, yes, you can repair them. Uh, the caveat to that is it's not easily done. Now, uh, can you, and what we recommend people, if you have an FR inventory and you have some garments that are thread-worn, or don't throw them out. Keep that shirt, uh, for example, to make patches from. Uh, going on, you could go on the internet. You can order yourself up some aramid thread, and then you could realistically cut patches and sew them on to your garments, and that would be in compliance. If you have a industrial launder or a third party taking care of your clothing, they have to make sure and they have to be able to show you that they can stop their current repair process for 6535 non-FR uniforms and they can switch out a sewing machine, put Nomex thread on there, and they're going to utilize uh, FR fabric to make that repair. Now, all that complexity, all that policing can be eliminated by ordering new garments. Now, at what point do you want to get a new garment versus repair it? That's going to be uh, entirely up to the, that individual, uh, up to that wear, or up to that uh, that company to do that. Uh, one of the one of the comparisons that I like to what to say is, hey, look, you, you you wouldn't make repairs to your fall harnesses. You wouldn't let people walk around with ripped, torn, uh, frayed fall harnesses or having holes in their fall harnesses. Kind of start thinking about your FR clothing in that context as you would your fall harness. You don't make repairs to fall harnesses. I don't recommend you make repairs to uh, your FR clothing. They're both life-saving pieces of equipment, and the less integrity uh, or the less damage to the integrity of that system is just for me personally the better way to go. Can employees wear polyester undergarments with FR clothing? No, you cannot. And part of the training, and again, we're, we just touched the tip of the iceberg as we go into uh, selecting an FR clothing program and training on an FR clothing program. One of the things that, that we do is from a training standpoint is we make sure that folks understand what they can and what they cannot wear underneath their FR clothing. Because remember, what's the definition of FR clothing? It just puts itself out. All that thermal energy, all that radiant heat, all that ultraviolet, all those things are still happening. So when you wear something like a athletic performance undergarment, for example, something that works great in the gym, something that wicks moisture and keeps you cool, when you wear that under your FR clothing, that synthetic, when it comes in contact with that short-term thermal exposure, is going to melt and cause horrific injuries underneath your FR clothing. The standards allow for you to wear natural fibers underneath your FR garment. By natural fibers, that's 100% cotton, that's wool, and that's silk. Now, 100% uh, cotton, that's your, you know, just think about that's your, your white BVDs. Uh, silk, pretty easy, and wool, maybe in the wintertime you're going to do that. The other option that's becoming very, very popular these days is, uh, is looking to FR base layers or making sure that that undergarment also has flame-resistant properties as opposed to just being 100% cotton. So, yes, very important that we train people, especially folks who are new to FR into what they can wear underneath it because making the wrong choice uh, could be just as bad as if making uh, as wearing uh, non-FR in an area where you needed FR. Are fire rated paper masks available on the market and do manufacturers of paper masks give caution on use in safe environments? Interesting question. Uh, I can honestly say that I think on the number of times that I've done this webinar, that's the first time I've been asked about uh, that type of respiratory protection and whether or not it has FR properties. I am not 
uh, I'll be honest with you, I am not aware of that. Um, it's definitely something of interest, uh, understanding that if you are doing housekeeping of a small particulate, that you would be wearing some kind of respiratory protection. So what I would like to do is do a little bit of research, and I will uh, look to answer that question offline depending on what I find out. But off the top of my head, I am not aware of anybody doing that for that level of respiratory protection. What's the enforcement exposure of an employer who allows an employee to self-clean FR clothing? Ultimately, and uh, the employer is going to respond, be responsible still for care and maintenance. Uh, meaning that I can do all the right things, I can supply the training, I can have that employee sign off on the fact that they've under that they've participated in the training, they understand the training. We send them home with their shirts, pants, and or coveralls. We send them home with the cleaning instructions. Uh, we do all the right things, and still at the end of the day, uh, that employer is responsible for uh, how that. PPE is cared for and, and maintained. So you can do all those right things. And as far as I, how I understand the interpretation and as far as some of the conversations I've had with compliance officers, that employer is still responsible for making that final decision. Meaning if I'm walking on the job floor and I see garments that are in disrepair and are poorly maintained and poorly cleaned, it's my responsibility to do something uh, and not allow that to happen. And if something were to happen to where that was deemed added to, uh, then it could be it's going to fall back uh, ultimately on the employer. Now, I say that, and I don't want to put people into a panic by saying, "Oh my gosh, now I'm responsible for how people's, you know, sh sh how people's clothes look." Yeah. Think about all the PPE that you make evaluations on on a daily basis. You wouldn't let someone walk through a facility where if you require them to wear a hard hat, you're not going to let them walk through the facility with a crack in their hard hat. You're not going to walk someone walk through the facility with only one lens in their safety glasses. Uh, you're not going to have someone with uh, only half of a, uh, you know, improper scaffold. So we make as employers, we make or empower our people to protect and make those decisions on a daily basis to where your safety directors, your supervisors can pull people off the line all the time for not having or implementing the PPE. We do that today. So shirts, pants, and coveralls from an FR standpoint, whether they're properly maintained and or clean, it's just another piece of PPE that we're, we're making those decisions on currently. So I don't want to put anybody into a panic thinking that how do, how do I do that. Again, if you're going down your line and you don't think someone's PPE is in proper repair, you're going to pull them off the line, whether that's a, whether that's a fall harness or whether that's a, a shirt, pant, or coverall. You're doing the same thing. Where is a good place to find more information on the DHA, specifically how to conduct it? Uh, really, the DHA, best way to go is, is go to NFPA and uh, purchase uh, 652 and, uh, and go from there. That, that would be my, my first and foremost. Uh, I would get on, get the standard in my hand, read the standard, and then if you have any questions, uh, you, can, you can definitely uh, submit those to NFPA uh, and or you can then start to look for uh, some folks who are doing some work in DHA right now. There are a number of engineering companies who have uh, kind of seen this as part of their offering to where you had a lot of folks, if you remember back, uh, when NFPA 70E came out and arc flash uh, hazard analysis started to become something that was uh, was needed in the marketplace, you saw a lot of these electrical safety folks uh, start doing uh, arc flash uh, hazard analysis for uh, facilities. You're now seeing a lot of uh, engineering companies that are looking into doing dust hazard analysis. So 
Uh, hopefully, if anybody needs any additional information on that, they can definitely reach out to me. I can definitely send them to folks that have done that for uh, a number of our uh, customers, and I can definitely share that with them. How fine do word part? How fine do wood particles need to be to present a hazard? Uh, Saw mills often say that green wood dust is not as hazardous as dry wood dust. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I th I think from a common sense standpoint, if it's wet, it's going to be really hard to ignite, and then secondly, it's going to be really hard to lift and suspend in air. Uh, so that's kind of where that comes into be because if you think about it, regardless of how fine my dust is, if it's sitting in a big pile and never gets displaced to where it's diffuse in open air, it's technically not going to be a hazard. Now, can I guarantee that that's going to happen all the time? That's where you have to do your hazard analysis in your facility to, de to determine whether those opportunities are available or not. What size does dust have to be? That's where, if you remember the slide where we saw the footprint and then we saw the, uh, the, the, the number 40 industrial sieve there, that, that sieve uh, is what folks use. If, if particulate falls through the bottom of that, you are small enough to be considered hazardous. And I'll tell you, when we first started researching this, uh, it's amazing. Uh, almost everything except for, uh, you know, things that we th you'd think of, like salts and things like that, that no matter what they are, they're not going to ignite. The, the number of industrial dusts that are potentially flammable is, is, is crazy. It's, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of them there are, but you just start thinking into... I mean, metal dust, aluminum dust, iron dust, magnesium dust. Then you get into all the organics when you're dealing with your wood, your wood byproducts. Then you get into your agricultural, almost every single thing that ag agricultural-wise uh, is going to be combustible. I mean, things like apple dust are on the list. Uh, whey protein uh, is on the list. So these lists of industrial dust that you can go to OSHA. Uh, .gov. You can go to combustible dust on the left-hand side, click on that. You can actually see the poster uh, that OSHA is, is uh, provided, and the number of dust is just, uh, it, it kind of catches you uh, off guard when you first see it, that there's so many on there. Is there a requirement to prove you do not have a dust hazard? Uh, by default, I believe that date of September 2018 is when you have to have your dust uh, tested. So by by default, if you're generating dust and uh, your dust is a small enough particulate, uh, yeah, you would have to by default go get it tested, and that test would then tell you whether or not it, 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 it's combustible or not. If it's not combustible, then it doesn't matter how small or how diffuse or anything like that. Uh, if it's deemed combustible, then that's when all the what we've talked about today comes into play. But of course, if it's not combustible, it's not a hazard, and uh, you wouldn't be required to do the things that we talked about today as far as, far as FR clothing is my understanding. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speaker. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Derek Sang, everyone at Bulwark, and all of our listeners. Thank you, and have a safe